take too long. Please welcome the Basino Text. And we're called that because we play bassoon and we're a bit kind of lunatics at times as well. You have to be a bit crazy to play the bassoon. Okay. So uh, over here, I'll introduce the group. This is Kathy and Mike and Medina. And my name is Fraser. So we've got a fun show for you, I think. But first, you must be dying to know something about the bassoon. Uh, that's why you're all here, right? Find out about the bassoon. So first of all, does anybody know what family of the orchestra these are from? There are four families of instruments in the orchestra. Any ideas? Right, woodwinds. And they're called woodwinds because they're made of wood, and they take your wind to blow them. That's how you make the sound, with your own wind. And they're a special kind of woodwind. They're double reed instruments, which means that there are two pieces of wood that are tied together, and that's how you make the sound. So they're double reeds, two pieces of wood. And a reed all by itself doesn't sound much like a bassoon. It sounds like this. Bravo, bravo, bravo. Okay, now in music, it's a general principle that when the instrument gets bigger, the sound gets lower. Uh, just the way I'm, my voice is probably lower than your voice. That's because I'm bigger than you are. <laughs> so we're going to give you a demonstration of that and show you how the sound of that little reed changes into the sound of a bassoon. So here's the sound of that reed on the mouthpiece. And now that's going to make the whole instrument about a foot long. Very nice. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to add the first joint of the bassoon, which is called a wing joint. You know, it's called that because I think that the fellow who was naming the joints was a little drunk that night. He found it looked a bit like a chicken wing. But it will add, it'll make the whole instrument about three feet long. It sounds like this. Now, next in line, we have a joint called the boot joint. It's called that because it's at the bottom of the bassoon, just like your boots are at the bottom of you. So it, it's a funny kind of joint because the air goes down one side and comes up the other. There's a little, turns the corner, does a U-turn at the bottom of, the air of that joint. 
So now we've got a bassoon that actually is about five feet long. It sounds like this. Getting there. Starting to sound like a bassoon. Okay, now the next joint is called the long joint. It's called that because it's long. And now we're going to get almost the sound of a bassoon. So this is seven feet worth of bassoon. Okay, almost got that last low note. Now to get the very lowest note, we have to add the last joint, which is called the bell joint. It's called that because it looks a little like a bell turned upside down. And now we'll sound, you know, that that'll sound through the full eight feet of the bassoon, and it sounds like this. <laughs> okay, Kathy, you show them how it sounds like. This is. We'll try this again. Low B flat, lowest note on the bassoon. I can't believe it. Okay, Mike, Mike, show them what it sounds like. This is a low B flat. Here we go. students playing together, see what it sounds like.
scratch. Now you see that there's one instrument up here that we haven't talked about just yet, and it's called the contrabassoon. And it is twice the size of a regular bassoon. So I, want to, I need a volunteer here. Somebody from the front, too, would like to volunteer? Now we have a special treat for you today. We have a story written about a very wonderful and amazing dragon named Darwood, who you see right in the center above the court's hat. Dar Darwin is a young dragon. He's just like you in a lot of ways, except that he's quite exceedingly green. So we're going to play a lot of music for you now. So sit back and relax. <laughs> dragon didn't know what to do. His burning, looting, and terrorizing exam was a week away, and he didn't want to do it. It wasn't that he couldn't do it, he just didn't want to. His burning, looting, and terrorizing teacher, Margu the Menacing, was furious. What do you mean you're not doing the exam, Lord Margu? He was a fierce, large, old dragon whose scales had turned a dark charcoal color from years of belching. Uh, belching fire, that is. <clears throat> Now that's, uh, that's Margu over there. Every dragon for 900 years has done this exam. You can't be a self-respecting dragon without having your burning, looting, and terrorizing license. Why do you think we can breathe fire? It ain't for roasting chickens, you know? Darwin was unmoved. Not every dragon ends up burning down villages and scaring knights. Every dragon from this village does, said Margu, waving a yellowish-gray claw in Darwin's face. For 900 years, this town has been producing the fiercest and the hottest dragons on the planet. Dragons scare humans and then steal their shiny things. That's what dragons do. And suddenly you, Mr. So Important, Darwin the Dragon, want to change all that. Darwin stared at his feet and said nothing. Margu tried a different approach. Look, Darwin, you're the best flyer in the village. You're smart and quick. Okay, so you're not the meanest dragon around. That can all change as you get older. But if you say no to this exam now, you're cutting off any chance for your future. You can't let all your natural talent go to waste. Burning, looting, and terrorizing, son. B-L-T. That's the only way to go. Darwin pressed his lips together so they made a thin straight line 
looked Margu straight in the eye and said, I want to play the bassoon. <laughs> Whew, Margu was so surprised he let out a ball of flame that made Darwin's eyes smart for a second. The bassoon? Oh, you've been talking to that old windbag Jeloisa again. No, 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 no. You can't go tootling in some stupid pipe for the rest of your life. You're a dragon for Pete's sake. Dragons burn, loot, and terrorize. They don't spend all day playing little cheese for tootin' minuets. <laughs> now, Jeloisa's a dragon and she plays the bassoon. Eh, yeah, well, that's different. Jeloisa was never good at anything else. She had no choice. You, you've got real flying talent. You could really be a somebody, Darwood. Think about it. The exam's next Monday. I'll expect to see you there. Don't disappoint me. And don't disappoint your parents. They're really counting on you to finish first this year. Remember, B-L-T. And with that, Margu gave the traditional warrior's roar and flapped off in a cloud of hot dust. <laughs> Darwood flopped down right where he stood and plumped his head dejectedly on his front paws. His parents, it had been hard enough to try to convince Margu, but his parents, they would be mortified if they knew he was still thinking of playing the bassoon. He'd been through this with them months ago, and they had made him promise to stop dreaming about the bassoon. He tried, but he just couldn't do it. He just couldn't get his heart into all the usual dragon pursuits. He'd be in the middle of blowing fire rings, and he'd think of some beautiful melody on the bassoon. Or he'd be dive bombing a target field, and he'd start thinking about how much he'd rather be playing a C major scale. He just couldn't seem to get his mind off the bassoon. Finally, he decided he had to talk to Jelweza just one more time. Jelweza was the village priestess and all-around healing person, and that's her over here. When dragons got married, or had headaches, or both, they made the trip over to Jelweza's cave. She lived right beside the water and spent so much time in the water that even sometimes she looked like she was underwater even when she was standing on the shore. People said she had magic powers. Darwood wasn't so sure about that, but he did know that she was very kind, and just being near her made him feel good. That's why he sometimes visited her, even if it wasn't a special occasion, and even if he wasn't sick. They would sit and talk about a lot of things, and if he was lucky, she would get out her bassoon and play some tunes for him. The first time he heard her play, he knew that that was what he wanted to do with his life. But when he finally got up the courage to ask Jeloisa if he could become a bassoonist too, she wasn't very encouraging. She said he would have to get his parents' permission, and then find an instrument, and then work very hard. Well, he hadn't got past the first part. When he'd asked his parents if he could get a bassoon, they had looked at each other for a long moment, and then told him it was impossible, and that he was going to be a regular fighting dragon just like the rest of the family. He had pleaded with them, but they wouldn't budge. He had tried to convince Jeloisa to teach him anyway, but she didn't want to go against his parents' wishes. So she had told him to give up the idea of playing a bassoon and to use that same energy to be the best dragon he could be. Well, now he was ready to plead with Jalwiza to give him one last chance. He picked himself up and flapped his wings and took off, gliding down and down to the seashore where Jalwiza's cave stood. When he was only a few meters from her doorway, he spotted her multicolored back slicing through the water as she rose to meet him. Greetings, Darwood, she called as she stepped calmly out of the water and shook herself dry. What brings you down here in such a hurry? Jalwiza, you just gotta help me play the bassoon. Margu came to see me and says I have to do that BLT exam next week. But I can't concentrate on the exam. I keep thinking about the bassoon. I don't want to fly around and scare people, Jalwiza. I want to be a bassoonist like you. Please, please teach me to play. I'll do anything you want. Oh, Darwood, she said, shaking her head. Even if I could teach you, you'd need a bassoon, and you couldn't get one without your parents getting involved. But there must be some way to get a bassoon without them. How did you get your bassoon? Well, I can't tell you that, Darwin. It's a secret. And then Jelwiza got a very distant look in her eyes like she was replaying a long scene in her mind. After a minute or so, she looked Darwin straight in the eye for a long time. He looked so desperate and unhappy that she finally saw him. Well, I might be able to help you get a bassoon, Darwin. Darwood leapt to his feet with his eyes wide and opened his mouth to say something, but, said Jell Weaver quickly, it's a long shot, and even if it works and you do find a bassoon, you'll still have to get your parents' permission to take lessons. I'll take that chance, said Darwood without hesitation. I just gotta have a bassoon. 
Okay, well, here's what you do, said Joe Weasel, putting her arm around Darwood and carefully turning him until he was facing due east, looking across the water. Sometimes dragons, if they're very lucky, can find a wild bassoon. A wild bassoon? Yes, they're very rare, but I have heard of them. You'll have to travel very far to the east and search in all kinds of odd places to find one. I'll do it. I'm a good flyer. Just tell me where to look. Well, that's the catch. I can only tell you where to start. The rest is up to you. Oh, how will I know where to go? Listen very carefully to what your heart tells you. Everything will turn out just fine if you let go and let your heart tell you what it knows. Darwin wasn't sure this made sense, but he had a feeling that Jalwiza knew something he didn't. So he swallowed hard and made his decision. Okay, I'm going. Where to first? First, you have to travel far back in time to when our ancestors, the dinosaurs, walked the earth. Back in time? I can't do that. Yes, you can. Remember, said Jalwiza sternly, believe in yourself and listen to your heart. Okay, okay, I'll try. And with that, Darwin took a deep breath, flapped his wings, and lifted slowly off the ground, thinking all the time about how much he wanted a bassoon. He looked back to wave and saw that Jalwiza was already a small smudge of color down below. Somehow, though, he was sure she was smiling. Darwin flew and flew and flew, faster and faster. Soon he was going faster than he had ever flown before. For a split second he was frightened, then he heard a voice inside him that said, You have to fly fast to go back in time. Just keep your mind on that bassoon. Descended to the ground. He saw that he was landing in a misty, hot jungle. He was about to comment to himself on how empty it all seemed when suddenly he saw a stegosaurus crash through some trees several meters away. <laughs> he didn't notice Darwin just disappeared again into the jungle. But seeing it was enough to let Darwin know that he had reached his first destination. He was amazed. I never thought I could do it. I flew back in time. He smiled and patted himself on the back with his wing. Not bad for old Darwin, if I do say so myself. He looked around for some clue as to where this wild bassoon might be. Suddenly, he heard that voice from inside him again. Look just to the right of the spring. Thanks, thought Darwin. That must be my heart talking. Well, let's go find a spring. So Darwin set off into the jungle to find the spring. Pretty soon, he heard some water dripping. He 
turned towards it. Then a strange thing happened. He heard a bassoon. He dashed off towards the sound and stumbled into a clearing in the trees where there stood a small spring of water bubbling out of a rock into a pool below. of the spring, he found no bassoon. He looked to the left of it just to be sure, but there was no bassoon. In fact, there was nothing there at all except moss and rocks. He was puzzled. Then he got depressed. There's no wild bassoon here. I was crazy to even think such a thing existed. And with that, he trudged back to the spot where he had landed. He sat down with a thump and folded his arms and his wings. Now what? No bassoon here and no idea where to go next. He picked up a stick that was lying there and started to draw, absentmindedly in the dirt. He drew a curve or two here and a curve or two there, and when he came out of his daydream and actually looked at what he had drawn, he realized he had drawn what looked a bit like a camel. He laughed and he was about to erase it with his stick when it dawned on him. A camel. Maybe I'm supposed to go somewhere where there are camels, he thought. Hmm, now where are there camels? I know, the desert. Arabia, maybe. Hey, it's worth a try. It's a good thing I picked up this stick, he thought. He looked again at the stick, and he saw that it was actually quite a handsome stick, as far as sticks went. Red and smooth, without too many knots. Well, I think I'll take it with me. Maybe it's a lucky stick. And with that, he took to the air again. I have to get closer to my time, I'd say, to find Arabia, he thought to himself. So he flew very high and very steadily toward the west. Soon he felt like landing and hoped he might be lucky in finding the right time and place for Arabia. Sure enough, he found himself over a huge desert of sand dunes. It was evening and lights were just being lit in the few towns that he could see. His eye was caught by one light that was stronger than all the others, so he flew towards that. As he got closer, he heard laughter and music, and realized that the light was coming from a huge tent that seemed to belong to someone very rich. It was surrounded by strong, handsome horses, well saddled and groomed. 
They waited for their masters, who were having a luxurious feast inside the tent. Darwin approached the tent carefully, making sure he was in the shadows, and found a gap in the tent wall where he could see what was happening. He had never seen anything like it. A very large...